Hello, and a warm welcome to all our attendees and welcome to the LSE for this online event. I'm Julian Legrand. Um, I was Richard Titmus Professor of Social Policy at the LSE from 1993 to 2011. Uh, I'm now at the Marshall Institute where I'm studying, where I'm working on altruism and philanthropy, um, various interests of Richard Titmus, whose uh, work we are here uh, attended to celebrate. Um, this event is actually for the purpose of celebrating John Stewart's biography of Richard Titmus, which was published in June this year. Titmus was a pioneer of social policy research and a very influential figure in Britain's post-war welfare debates. He wrote extensively on a range of subjects, health, inequalities and other social welfare issues, many of which have come to the fore just in the middle of our uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It's fitting, therefore, that this event forms part of the LSE's Shaping the Post-COVID World series, a platform for the debate about the direction the world could and should be taking after this crisis, and what policies national and global actors ought to pursue. And as the chair of today's event, um, I am delighted to introduce a panel of speakers to discuss what we can learn from Richard Titmus as we look forward to the post-COVID world. Now, um, we, are, we are very lucky to, to have had John Ashworth attending with us. He has to leave us very shortly. So I'm going to, without further ado, introduce him. He's uh, the Shadow Secretary of State for Health, and he's previously served as a Shadow Minister without portfolio. He was elected MP for Leicester South in May 2011. John, we're delighted to have you here. And um, perhaps we can uh, just over to you uh, for a few minutes before you have to leave us. Well, thank you very much, Julian. And, it, and it's a, a great pleasure and honour to have been asked to offer a few brief reflections at, at, on this, uh, at this seminar. Uh, and I readily accepted the invitation and I was very excited to accept the invitation when it came through because Richard Titmus is a huge influence over my thinking, over my values as a, as a, uh, as a Labour politician. And I think uh, much of what Richard Titmus wrote and stood for uh, is incredibly relevant to today. Now, I have got to go imminently because we have a debate here in the House of Commons about to start any moment on COVID and I'm going to have to rush off. So I will be extremely brief. But I think I think if Richard Titmus was alive today, what would be he be making of this biggest public health crisis that we faced in over a, a hundred years? Well, I think he would be excited and encouraged that that great example of universalism, the National Health Service, has stood the test of time. That it was a, I think he described it in, in, uh, in one of his pieces, is it was that, that great, that most unsorted act of British social policy in the 20th century, which has led to values of reciprocity, alt altruism, and social duty. I, I'm slightly paraphrasing it, but that was the, it, 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 he, he made points along those along those lines, and I think he and I think there can be no question that it has led to those values of reciprocity and social du social duty as we walk down the streets and see the rainbows in the windows and the applause rippling through our streets. And I think he would have been incredibly encouraged by that. But I think he would have been uh, staggered that the lessons that he thought we had learned 30, 40 years ago around how poverty and deprivation drive poorer health outcomes uh, have not manifested themselves in, in policy solutions years later. And when people ask why has the United Kingdom fared so poorly in its response to COVID, I mean, yes, it's about the misjudgments and mistakes of, of this government. I mean, you'd expect me to say that, I'm a Labour uh, uh, politician. Yes, it's about the fact that we entered this crisis after 10 years of uh, 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 below, below average uh, increases in uh, health expenditure, after 10 years of cutting back public health budgets. But I also strongly believe we entered this crisis less resilient as a society because we didn't learn those lessons around how deprivation and inequalities impacts on health. So Michael Marmer, who is also a, a huge influence over my thinking as well, and has done a, a groundbreaking work in, uh, in, 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 in recent times, uh, highlights that life expectancy has begun to stall, indeed go backwards for some of the very poorest 
in society, that our child mortality rates in this country are one of the worst in, uh, in, in Europe. And that actually, we know that we have a higher burden of chronic illness in many of our poorer areas. So it should come as no surprise, tragically and sadly, that the area is now fa faring worst from COVID outbreaks and then going into these tier three lockdowns. Uh, areas like uh, such as Merseyside, Knowsley, parts of the north, areas where there is a higher burden of chronic illness and where there is quite grinding levels of deprivation, uh, uh, deprivation and poverty. So, so uh, our failure to learn the lessons from Richard Titmus and others and Michael Marmot in recent years means we were less resilient and, and, and more vulnerable to this, to this pandemic uh, uh, when it hits us. But we also know that this, that this virus particularly exploits these illnesses, it exaggerates these inequalities. So the answer, the response to dealing with this virus for the future has to go beyond just you know, the, the, the advances in therapeutics, the advances in, uh, that we hope we will see soon in terms of a vaccination. We have to do something even more fundamental because we will not deal with this virus for the medium to long term unless we now have a real big health inequality strategy as a society, because the virus, I'm afraid, is endemic in uh, now, and that means that those from the um, uh, more deprived backgrounds are particularly vulnerable. And we see this now in our critical care admissions. Our critical care admissions are increasing, particularly in the north. At this stage in the first wave, by the way, critical care admissions were coming down. They're going up, even though the overall uh, increase in the virus is more muted than spring. But we are seeing a disproportionate numbers of people in those critical care admissions from disadvantaged backgrounds, as well as from black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds. So I think, I think my, my, th th for us to really get on top of this virus and create the sort of society where we can go back to some degree of normality, whatever that means <laughs> in this current circumstances, means that we will only really tackle it if we have a proper health inequality strategy hand in hand with um, ex expansion of, of, of medicines and vaccinations. And that's more than just the National Health Service, as we all know. That's more than just well-functioning public health. That's decent social care for our elderly. That's real investment in early years and children's health and children and, and dealing with uh, uh, child poverty. I think when we look at some of the works that Richard Timmons wrote around malnutrition in children and so on, I think he would be quite appalled that we are, we are currently allowing child poverty to rise to some of the highest levels that we all have had since the child poverty measures came in came into effect, if, if the government continue on the current trajectory. I think it'd be quite appalled that we're spending billions on all kinds of different initiatives, but we couldn't find the money to, to fund children's free school meals over Easter holidays yesterday in the, in the, in, in the House of Commons. So, so, so I think Richard Timmis's writings and teachings are more relevant than ever and we have, we have to uh, apply them to modern times, but the principles of, of what he was talking about and outlined are actually key to how we get on top of this virus in the future as well, because we will not, we'll, we will not deal with this virus unless we tackle these growing health inequalities in society, because it just leaves people more vulnerable to a virus that attacks both, but, but, but attacks both their biology because of what health inequalities do to, to illness, uh, uh, but it also affects people who are in low paid jobs, overcrowded, overcrowded accommodation and, li and living and working in very um, public facing jobs where they can't where they can't take time off work because they're sick and so on. So so I think Richard Titmus is more relevant than ever. And I think it's really welcome that you're putting on this event. I would have liked to have spoken for a bit longer and developed my thoughts in a slightly more coherent way, rather in that sort of whistle stop way. Um, but I'm afraid the parliamentary timetable is forcing me to leave now. But thank you very much. Uh, for putting on this event. It was immensely coherent, John. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're very grateful to you for, for taking the time and good luck in the debate. <clears throat> Hope that some of your ideas get implemented. Uh, <coughs> right, well, um, return to the, um, the main schedule. Um, I'm going to introduce, we have um, three speakers, three additional speakers. Um, John Stewart himself, who is the author of the biography of Richard Titmus and um, for which this occasion is marking and celebrating, indeed, the publication of that. Uh, uh, Lucinda Platt. Um, Lucinda is Professor of Social, Social Policy and Sociology and Head of Department of Social Policy. Um, her research focuses on economic inequalities, particularly those relating to ethnicity and migration, gender and disability. And she works on the history of social policy and the evolution of the British welfare state. 
uh, which of course Titmus was a major player. Uh, Dr. Sarah Machado is a researcher in the Department of Health Policy at the LSE, and he's, she's specializing in a particular area of, of great interest to Titmus, which is blood donation and organ transplantation. Uh, her research is looking at the behavior of blood and organ supply and demand, particularly in response to exogenous shocks and policy changes. And she's currently looking at the effects of contingent rewards for blood donations and the determinants of blood do donor retention. Uh, and how healthcare payment systems affect transport decisions. Um, so um, for Twitter users in the audience, let me just say the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE COVID-19. This event is being recorded and hopefully it'll remain available as a podcast, assuming we get no technical difficulties on the way. As usual, everyone will have a chance to put their questions. Um, to submit your questions, if we could ask you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be then submitted to me and I will pose as many as possible to the speakers. If you could let us know your name and affiliation, that would be helpful. We're particularly keen to hear from our students, um, alumni and incoming students. So please let us know if that's you. Um, so without further ado, I'm now delighted to hand over to John. John. I was just unmuting there. Um, okay, thank you, Julian. I'm going to um, devote my uh, time to two aspects of Titmus's uh, career as well. First of all, a kind of overview of his time at the London School of Economics. And then secondly, I'm going to kind of focus in on uh, some central characteristics of his thought around the ideas of altruism, social solidarity, and social growth. So to start with Titmus at the LSE, uh, Richard Timmons was appointed as the first chair in social administration at the London School of Economics in 1950, and he stayed there until his death uh, in 1973. At the time of his appointment, the department which he joined was primarily concerned with uh, the training of social workers, uh, but as his inaugural lecture, Social Administration in a Changing Society, uh, made clear, Titmus was going to seek to expand the scope and scale of both his department uh, and the subject matter uh, of what we now describe as the academic field of social policy. Uh, went under a number of name changes, which are immensely confusing, and let's just call it social policy. To this end, new courses were introduced uh, and staff appointed who would seek to bring academic rigor uh, to that area of study. Uh, it's invidious to, to name names in some respects, but individuals such as Brian Abel Smith, uh, Peter Townsend and David Donison, uh, each in their different ways, uh, ex helped expand the field of social policy, indeed create the field of social policy, uh, with at least some of them going on to other institutions, and I'll come back to that in a second. Timmerson and his colleagues produced a huge quantity of written material as well as, and I think this is also crucial, uh, participating in various official and unofficial bodies. So, for instance, Titmus, Abel Smith, and Townsend, each in various ways, uh, contributed to Labour Party pensions policy uh, in the 1950s and beyond. Titmus, was a Titmus himself was a member of bodies such as the Royal Commission on Medical Education uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury's Committee on Racial Equality. Expansion of Titmus's department was important not only for the LSE, although it was important for the LSE, but also in developing the field of social policy at other British institutions, people like Donison and Townsend go off to other, uh, higher education institutions to, to spread the word, as it were, uh, it, it, both in Britain and abroad, uh, notably the United States, Titmus had a great fan base in the United States, uh, but also in Israel uh, and certain African countries. Uh, by the time of his death, Titmus's department was preeminent in the field of social policy. Uh, not only in Britain, but also uh, arguably globally. Timmons and his colleagues had set the agenda in discussions of how social policy was to be formulated and implemented, uh, although their approach was soon to be challenged uh, from a number of directions, which kind of partly helps explain John Ashworth's lament that, you know, Timmons was telling, uh, telling us a lot of this stuff 40 or 50 years ago and we're still in no dissimilar positions today. Anyway, that, Timmis had a life before he went to the LSE, incidentally, but that, that's the, the bare bones of his time at the school. 
What I want to do now is move on to his views about altruism, social solidarity, and social growth. Uh, this year marks the not only the 120th, uh, 125th anniversary of the LIC, uh, but also the 50th anniversary of the last of Titmus's books, which was published in his lifetime, uh, The Gift Relationship. This was a culmination of a long running and acrimonious dispute with the Institute of Economic Affairs, the IEA, over the place or otherwise uh, of the market in healthcare provision. It will come as no surprise that the IEA had from the outset been highly critical of the way in which the NHS was financed and operated. Put very crudely, Titmus argued in the gift relationship that the method of acquiring uh, and distributing blood for medical purposes utilised in Britain was morally and economically uh, superior to that in especially the United States. In the former, in Britain, donors gave their blood freely uh, and for no financial gain, and their actions were altruistic, not only for that reason, but also because their gift was, by definition, used to help strangers whom they could not possibly know personally. So you, you, your blood, in other words, might end up uh, being used to help somebody of whom you potentially could have morally disapproved, but you wouldn't have had any way of knowing that, if you like. In the United States, on the other hand, uh, the acquisition of blood was often a commercial transaction, which brought with it dangers such as poor quality blood from impoverished or desperate donors uh, and blockages in the system, uh, resulting either in uh, shortages of blood uh, or its oversupply. For Titmus, it was also crucial that the British system operated within the structures of a universalist healthcare system, the National Health Service, rather than in the market-based system prevalent in the US. In other words, the NHS uh, was, the, was enabling the exercise of individual altruism uh, in a way not open to the situation in America. Uh, and when properly designed and implemented, this enabling of altruism uh, was an important function of social welfare uh, and could uh, triumph over the market. In, this, in a sense, this was the message of the gift relationship that altruism could triumph over the market. This was good not only for society as a whole, uh, but also for individuals. As Titmus put it in the gift, relations, uh, gift relationship, for human beings to love themselves, they had first to learn to love others. And for him, this was a fundamental uh, biological impulse. I'm sure biologists might dispute that, but for Titmus, this kind of metaphor was actually, as he saw, quite a profound one. <clears throat> this was part of his broader belief that individual freedom and autonomy were fundamental to a free society, but were best realized within collectivist uh, or universalist structures. The gift relationship continues to have its uh, committed supporters. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel, who spoke at an LSE event two or three weeks ago, uh, is a great fan of the gift relationship. Uh, he uh, spoke about it in the Wreath Lectures, uh, which, took place, which he contributed to about 10 years ago or so. Uh, and in 19, uh, sorry, <laughs> 2012, argued that the gift relationship was the best known illustration of markets crowding out non-market norms. Uh, and it was a classic study of blood donation. And I was quite struck just by the by watching Sandel's recent LSE lecture of, of how much he had to say, of how much he had to say would have uh, undoubtedly have been endorsed by Titmus, although we've moved on 50 years. So enabling the exercise of altruism is very important for Titmus and part of his broader concern with the promotion of social solidarity and social growth. Uh, this was a deliberate attempt on his part to challenge what he saw as the false, immoral and dangerous claims of individualism and materialism uh, in a shorthand less fair economics uh, and would help challenge inequalities in income, uh, wealth, uh, health outcomes uh, and the treatment of racial and ethnic minorities. While the origins and development of Timothy's uh, philosophy are complicated, at least in part they derive from his perceptions of the British home front uh, during the Second World War. Indeed, he was later to argue that when looking to explain the expansion of social welfare after the war, 
uh, the evacuation of, from Dunkirk and the Blitz had been much more important uh, than the famous report produced by William Beveridge in 1942. He became increasingly skeptical about Beveridge, but as he kept returning to the Blitz and evacuation as, uh, as kind of promoting social solidarity, which uh, in the slightly longer term ended up in the, the welfare state. Timmis's emphasis on social growth, meanwhile, was a direct rebuttal of the idea, uh, widespread in post-war Britain, that economic growth would in due course not only raise working class living standards, but would also see the end uh, of not only poverty as such, but also social and economic inequalities. Uh, worth remarking here uh, was that this idea was uh, not simply confined to advocates of free market economics, although they pushed it pretty hard, but was also held by influential Labour Party politicians uh, such as Anthony Crossland. Uh, and it was also built into the kind of vogue and sociological thought around this time, uh, around uh, the idea of the end of ideology. Uh, again, a, a complicated issue as well, but uh, nonetheless, it was some, that was something to which Titmus took considerable exception. Of course, none of Titmus's arguments went unchallenged, uh, either during his lifetime uh, or since. Uh, for example, uh, many, uh, and not just those who might be seen as political opponents, uh, question whether an emphasis on altruism truly reflected uh, the realities of human psychology and uh, behaviour. And, and, and again, it's kind of invidious to single out individuals, but one of the most enjoyable interviews I had when I was researching the book uh, was, was with Frank Field MP, who had uh, rather robust views about uh, Timmis' uh, love of altruism. So. And of course, with the rise of neoliberalism, the, the, the whole kind of ballpark changes, as it were, the whole agenda changes. Although I think, as John Ashworth very eloquently put it, you know, we should still, uh, at, at the very least, be thinking about uh, some of the ideas that Richard Timmis put forward uh, and some of the analysis that he gave of, uh, of post war Britain and uh, the travails of the welfare state. Uh, but with that, I'll stop for the moment and hand you back to Julian. Thank you very much, John. Um, well, without further ado, um, I will hand you on to Lucinda. Lucinda. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, and thank you, John, for that really interesting um, talk there. Uh, so I was, I'm, would like to say that uh, first, um, how much it pleases me to be um, head now of the department, which um, Titmus was so in, instrumental in, in forming, um, and, the, and the, the, this whole discipline of social policy. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk about um, a topic which is uh, very salient currently um, of um, income inequality um, and is where there's a lot of um, social policy research um, that has taken place um, both in the LSC and beyond and is taking place. So I'm going to, I want to talk about this book, which I hope you can see. My background is helpful. There, it comes and goes. Income Distribution and Social Change. Um, this is a book which um, uh, it was uh, written in the um, published in 1961, um, but it still is really uh, many of the ideas really chime with today. So in this, Titmus is talking about um, the gap between um, richer and poorer, um, inequality of incomes, um, and questions of measurement. So this is a this is a topic which still continues to debate to be debated about how much and whether inequality is increasing. Um, and he was really picking up some of these um, very uh, technical issues, um, but using them, as I'll say, to make, to make somewhat of a bigger agenda. Um, so, the, and the question of how things, how far things have got better or not, um, how far things have got worse in terms of inequalities is really kind of very, very salient and is particularly salient in, the, in this, in this COVID world we're li living in now. I can't say it's a post-COVID world yet. Um, he starts um, with um, some, as his starting point is some data um, from 19, some tax data from 1937. And interestingly, um, the late Tony Atkinson and Stephen Jenkins quite recently published a paper which uses that very same data as the starting point of their income series through. So you can see it's still going back to the same sources and same, um, same data. Um, 
one of the other issues he makes a lot of in this book is, is, the, is the relationship between income and wealth, the proper measurement of income, the proper measure, measurement of wealth. And we're seeing lots of attention to wealth. But I think his insights about how one or not one is transferred or not into the other and the implications of that um, are really important. Um, and this question about um, income concepts and economic welfare was also something he'd, um, he, he, he'd started thinking about much earlier in his um, uh, very influential essay in this book, um, uh, which is uh, on the social division of welfare. And in this, in this um, uh, essay, he lays the ground for the bigger book. He sets out kind of his, his agenda and he says he's only going to deal with part of it uh, because the first part needs, needs looking at the data. But he's taking issue with the claim that he's hearing a lot that um, uh, the problem of inequality has basically been solved um, since the end of the war by the welfare state, and that there's a concern that what is actually being seen now is a transfer of resources from the hardworking, taxpaying middle class uh, to those who receive social welfare. What he does is he points out that the definition of social welfare is applying to particular trans types of transfers such as family allowances or um, non-contributive pensions is essentially arbitrary. The economic welfare and the cost of that to the exchequer comes from three sources um, in terms of uh, the, the tax burden. So um, he talks about um, uh, fiscal adjustments, that is uh, tax allowances, tax benefits, child tax allowances, um, and as well as uh, social transfers. And also the third element is occupation welfare. So things like meal vouchers or company cars or all those benefits that occupations might give. Um, all these, um, uh, he shows uh, cost um, the exchequer in terms of the tax, tax revenues. Um, and so what was in fact happening was that these uh, other areas were ones which benefited the middle classes much more um, and um, uh, the solution was then found in, in decreasing the, the decreasing tax revenue was found by having less progressive tax, in fact, having regressive taxation that affected those on lower incomes more. So he kind of turns the table on this argument by pointing out we need to think about economic welfare and who's paying for it much more broadly. And maybe in some ways, this emphasis on who benefits uh, from the welfare state, he could, uh, he could be seen as um, a, being a precursor to some of Julian's own work on uh, who benefits from the welfare state and how the middle classes get a lot out of, for example, the National Health Service. So um, I don't know whether Julian's going to say any more about that later. But uh, um, but also when, when he developed these ideas in, um, in income distribution and social change, uh, Titmuss's agenda was also uh, about um, saying that it is not possible to uh, look at present and present welfare by reference to a past which is incommensurably different. You have to take the society as it is now, and only if you look at the social change that has occurred can you then start to measure the extent of inequality. You can't just assume that things in 1948 or 1956 are the same as they were in 1937. Um, and indeed, it would be a bit disturbing if they were, um, given all that had intervened in between. So he, he, uh, he talks about um, all the sorts of uh, d demographic and social changes that have taken place in terms of marriages, in terms of divorce, in terms of women entering the labour market, and in terms of the increase in um, the time children spent in education and were therefore dependents. Um, and thinking about this idea of dependency, and that is essentially what these different forms of welfare were trying to pay for. Um, and he, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he shows that the figures which suggest that uh, uh, there'd been massive redistribution to those at the poor end were actually highly flawed um, and that this didn't seem to be what was the case, though it was very hard to get at the precise numbers. And so in some ways his challenges to this tax data and what it actually showed was, I think, um, also foreshadowed work of the colleagues who uh, John's mentioned of um, Abel Smith and Townsend, who used a different sort of data, they used survey data um, uh, that had been collected for other purposes, collected sort of basically to measure, measure consumption and inflation, um, to uh, make the thesis that actually um, in, the, in their small but very influential and very interesting pamphlet, The Poor and the Poorest, that um, the, the if, um, ab abolition of poverty that was claimed, for example, by Seaburn Roundtree in his um, uh, third survey uh, had not occurred. The, the welfare state had not solved the problem of poverty. So I think he precedes this work, but um, 
well, I think the, the poverty agenda that was set, set off by this work of Abel Smith and Townsend um, has itself been very influential and carried on with the, with the precise analysis of poverty. Um, Titmuss's agenda was bigger, I think, um, and, slight, and, and slight, I would say in this book slightly different. There's an incredible amount of detail. The nitty gritty is quite um, uh, overwhelming in some days in his attempts to say, what do we know about population sizes? What do we know about the number of remarriages? What do we know about um, how many children um, who ha ha have left home are earning or ones who are still in education are earning? What does that imply for tax? So there's lots and lots of detail. But this detail, I think, uh, is, is part, part of his agenda, not only to try and draw attention to these social changes, but also to highlight um, really issues which are really salient at the moment. Uh, the aspects of um, inter vivos transfers between family members that um, enable the um, retention of advantage for those who are better off. Uh, the ways in which income is transferred into forms of capital that then can be discounted against tax. Um, and this whole issue of the relationship between income and capital is really getting much more attention um, now, um, uh, having not had so much before, but, but, but Titmus was right there doing this in the, in the early 1960s. And also the ex exercise of power, the consolidation of resources, um, and the increasing inequalities in wealth as well as in income, uh, and the regressive principles of taxation. These were all his targets. Um, and I think they're important ones that we can think about again and learn from now. Um, he concludes his book, so I'm wrapping up now. He concludes his book with, with the comment that um, ancient inequalities have assumed new and more subtle forms. Um, and I think we need to continue to inspect the ways in which there are new and more subtle forms that uh, economic welfare um, is expressed and uh, economic inequalities are, are, are formed and maintained. But nevertheless, I mean, despite his sort of starting point of this warning that we shouldn't extrapolate from the past to the present, I still think there's a huge amount we can learn from this work. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. Uh, Lucinda, a very important uh, um, summary of the of a key element of Titmus's work um, to do with income distribution and social change. Um, so um, over to uh, Sarah Machado. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, inviting me, for allowing me to speak about my favorite topic. Uh, I will try to stick to the short time frame that we have. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about um, following up from what both John and Lucinda just highlighted that um, Titmus's idea about welfare is that it can actually enable people to realize their full potential in a way, right? We can all benefit from benefits in a way, um, even if we're not receiving them. Um, having a welfare state means that the government is focusing on taking care, making sure that everybody has a minimum standard of life in a way, right? And knowing that that is the focus of the government actually may be able to enable a bigger support system, right? And not only at the central level, but also some organized support or even some uh, disorganized support and very informal. We have seen a great example of that. We've been talking about the pandemic and the COVID situation. Uh, I can think of my own neighborhood in which a lot of people um, organize themselves to do the shopping for uh, their more frail neighbors. And that is a perfect example of this welfare state, the welfare country, not just um, the government contribution towards it, not to mention the role of the NHS. Um, the truth is by enabling people to give of themselves in this particular way, what Tismas is highlighting is to say, People want to do this, they want to contribute, and they will be better off by doing so. Right? And one of the particular ways in which he focuses a lot is on, uh, by donating their blood. Right? Uh, why is this that important? Well, because there's actually no other way to produce blood. You know? So if people don't give blood, we have no blood. And we need it. And uh, that's highlighted in the book. Like The demand for blood is great, and it's increasing, and it's almost ever increasing in a way because of the types of treatments that we keep developing. Um, currently, there is, uh, I will probably hear it, yeah, people are trying to do synthetic blood in the lab, but the truth is, blood factories is, well, you and me. Um, and so that necessary contribution of each one of us to the healthcare system through our blood um, creates 
a very special market, you know, it, and we're talking about markets here. Um, and it's a market that is based on this gift relationship, right? And I go a bit further, I would call it even the gift economy. Uh, we're very familiar with the concept of the gig economy. Um, it actually runs in parallel with the gift economy. And I could list a number of markets that are only enabled or partially partially enabled by this willingness to, to give, right? Um, and what does it mean? It means that what we get in return right, is not linked to the value of the service that we're providing or to the good that we're giving. Um, for example, if I am going to sell a pint of my blood, um, maybe I'll get 10 pounds for it, right? But if I donate it, what I get in return will be something that has nothing to do with a monetary value for it. It will be what we can call the intrinsic uh, feel good that I get from it, the notion that I am altruistic and therefore I did something good and I feel good about myself. It may be a coupon that somebody gave me, uh, so there may be something actually palpable, uh, but the truth is it's not attached to the value of the pint of blood that I just donated. And that's the essence of this particular market, right? Um, what Titmus said was that it actually works. You know, it works. We don't need a price for this market. Look at the UK. We're doing fine. People give their blood. Look at the US. At that time, people were selling their blood. And well, they still had shortages. They still had problems. And in the UK, we had less problems than that. History evolved and the US actually caught up and now people are not allowed to sell their blood, only in Iran. Um, that's the only country in the world and that happens. The WHO caught up with Titmus as well and it defends that any blood supply system should be based on voluntary unpaid donation, right? And the motives that they give for it are summarized beautifully in Titmus's The Gift Relationship. So it's a big long arc in which we've been basically trailing after Titmus. Um, the, his idea is quite simple. It's like, if you pay people, you may be breaking their own system, right? We call it the crowding out of intrinsic motivation, but it's, it's way simpler than that. It's to say, people are not doing it to get paid. You know, people are doing it uh, maybe even if you, they might say, if you pay me, I won't do it. You know, that's the whole point. When we say, when Tismas is saying, if you pay people, you may be driving some people away from blood donation and harming your market even more than if you pay them, right? Um, that, I am extremely grateful for Tismas for that opening because what it did was that it allowed economists 20 to 30 years later to dive deep into that relationship. In a way, economics also had to catch up with it. Um, in 2005, we have Al Roth talking about these transplantation markets that don't need a price, you know, <laughs> matching markets. And then in 2008, you have um, quite a second seminal paper about was it must right? Do we actually crowd? Do we actually crowd out the intrinsic motivation of blood donors if we pay them? Right. So. A lot of time later, after the field of health economics evolved um, immensely, we caught up with Titmus. And that's where also my, my own research came in. It was to say, well, what actually happens in these markets, right? In which you're not using the price as a coordination mechanism, which is the typical situation. Supply meets demand by a price. Um, in these markets, we can get creative. You know, we are relying on people's willingness to give of themselves. We can get creative and we can fix the same problem, right? Um, and that's why I'm so grateful for this. Um, there are plenty of examples in health and healthcare in which these markets function um, quite well. Uh, I don't know if you are a blood donor, but you might be. And if you are in, the, in England, you get a text after your blood has been uh, um, dispatched, right? Um, and that is an example of things that evolved from this seminal uh, text by Titmus. And it's to say, we are giving people something in return for their donation. We acknowledge it, we recognize it, and we all contribute to this system, and we leave prices completely out of it. 
and it's beautiful. Um, it's true in blood donations, it's also true in organ donations. We also don't pay for organs and we also rely on people's altruism and willingness to donate of their organs while living or after they take. It's another market that is quite well functioning, uh, but also, for example, monetary contributions to health, right? If you think of crowdfunding, for example, it's also based on this giving economy, right? Uh, we saw a big boom in uh, crowdfunding related to COVID. It's because people are willing to do it. People want to contribute. And then finally, uh, markets that are, there are a lot of markets that are not purely based on these non-monetary mechanisms. We are not paying, but they rely on them. For example, uh, the altruism of uh, healthcare providers. And uh, we've all been, um, supporting our NHS heroes. Uh, there has been a lot of that going on during this pandemic. And it just highlights the fact that healthcare relies very heavily on this giving relationship, even if people are being paid for it, like uh, the healthcare providers are, but we also recognize the fact that they, actually, they are giving of themselves. And that's it for now. Right, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Sarah. Um, a very interesting point, particularly about the, uh, the heroism of our uh, NHS providers and the extent to which that reinforces the message of much of the gift relationship. Um, well, now, in a minute or two, I'm going to um, open uh, up the uh, debate to question and answers, and I can see that some are already coming in. Let me just remind you that um, to submit your questions, if you could use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, um, questions will be submitted to me and I'll pose as many as possible as I can to the speakers and please let us know your name and affiliation if you could when you do that. Um, before that though I just want to say a word or two myself about Titmus. Um, he, he was, uh, I first came across him um, or came across his work in a serious way when I was studying uh, neoclassical or well, I suppose we might call neoliberal economics um, in the United States. I was doing a PhD in economics and we we're getting a heavy dose of uh, what you might call market fundamentalism. Uh, and it was, um, uh, it was rather wonderful when this book was published. It got a very, um, it was, uh, as, um, as John was saying, it had a significant fan base in the United States. It got a, a respectful review from uh, Kenneth Arrow, who was a Nobel laureate to be in economics in the New York Times. Um, uh, and we seized on this with glee and ran to our, uh, our professors uh, and waving the book and saying there is another way to do things. That the world is not solely uh, market oriented. Um, uh, now, of course, as those of you who will know anything about my work will know, he didn't displace um, uh, the notion of uh, neoclassical economics completely from uh, my kind of analysis or my kind of thinking. And I still think um, that, uh, uh, that in some senses, Titmus was almost as naive as the people he was uh, challenging. The Institute of Economic Affairs, Economic Affairs, which John was mentioning, did actually um, uh, work basically on the presumption of what's called homo economicus, uh, essentially self-interested, that the, that the world was run uh, by uh, individuals uh, that were primarily self-interested. Uh, and actually, that not only was that, uh, was that um, a fact about the real world, but it also probably was rather a good thing that actually, in Adam Smith's important, in immortal words, that by people pursuing their own self-interest, they will be guided as if by an invisible hand towards promoting the public benefit, even though they had no intention uh, of doing so. Um, now, Titmus was reacting very strongly against that view, particularly when it was uh, taken into areas like healthcare uh, and uh, education and various other areas of social welfare. And he was right to do so. It clearly, that clearly breaks down in key respects um, the, the arguments the, for the use of the market in those areas. Um, but he perhaps went a little far the other way, I think, in uh, promoting what uh, Sarah was calling the gift economy. Um, uh, it's quite interesting, actually, because although, uh, as indeed Sarah was saying, it does actually promote the gift economy, uh, the gift relationship does promote the idea of gift economy. It is, of course, actually used to justify not, not 
uh, a society in which people give voluntarily, but a society, um, but, a, a, the, but the state, the government provision, uh, where people are taxed and then provided by uh, paternalistic, altruistic um, uh, medical care professionals and others um, with their um, with their uh, treatment or whatever. Um, and I think, and that raised me to the final thing. I just wanted to uh, really a question for uh, for John. Um, uh, the um, the work I now do, uh, I spend time looking at philanthropy. Um, now, philanthropy has an obvious link with the gift relationship. It's very interesting, actually, that uh, that um, philanthropy is coming in for quite a lot of stick these days, um, regarded as uh, being ideologically supportive of the of massive inequality, the kind that Lucinda was talking about, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, and also as being ultimately undemocratic. Um, uh, and what and its defenders of philanthropy actually very very rarely, it seems to me go to Titmus, um, where well, I think they could probably find some quite useful uh, names about the importance of the gift relationship and the need to, if there are, people have a pool of altruism in some senses, uh, uh, the, they must be given opportunity to exercise their, that behavior, exercise their altruism. That's very much Titmus's argument and that the market particularly, he would argue, closes off those opportunities. Um, but still, I can't help feeling that if Timus were alive today, uh, his attitude towards philanthropy um, would probably be rather unsympathetic. Um, and I wonder if I could just ask John um, what his views are on that. Do you think, where, where do you think he would stand on present uh, philanthropic developments? Yeah, I think he was very torn up with that whole area, actually, and, and not always desperately consistent. So at various points, he kind of goes off on one about patronizing welfare and, and, and kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of Lady Bountiful kind of side of things, uh, the, of the COS, as it was called back in the day, the Family Welfare Association, uh, uh, which uh, was demeaning and degrading and so on to uh, recipients. But he was also more keen than I think he's sometimes given credit for on uh, kind of initiatives which um, were voluntaristic, but they were also altruistic. And, and, and uh, he, when he's dying, when he's in hospital uh, on his last legs in the, the late, late 1972, early 1973, he does write about various aspects of hospital life, which includes kind of voluntary effort on the part of the people who run the, the hospital library, for example, uh, people who uh, do kind of voluntary visiting and stuff like that. Um, so, as, as you'll know as well as anybody, Julian, he, he was very much against, uh, Timmons was very much against claimants or clients or, or recipients of welfare being patronised or pathologised or whatever. But on the other hand, he does seem to have had a kind of space in his, his, his world view for uh, people acting voluntarily. Uh, and as I, th I tried to hint earlier, he saw this as part of... Uh, of being a human being in a free society, you know, that, that you couldn't just say the state would do everything kind of thing, but there had to be uh, space within the system for, for people to exercise individual effort, if you like. So I think he was kind of quite torn on this, and I think he was rather misunderstood. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. That's an interesting, uh, interesting point. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. Um, we. Um, now, I've got quite a number of questions coming in. Um, well, I think we'll just start um, directly with a question from Steve Ballard, um, uh, the London Hazard Centre and formerly Bradford University. Um, Kant contended that the universal purpose of all academic disciplines and social policy is to uphold the natural right of everyone on earth to enjoy life until its unpreventable end without prejudice. Uh, is there any evidence that uh, Timmers was familiar with uh, with Kant's contention? And if not, why not? Hmm. Do we? Do... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm certainly not familiar with the extent to which Timmers read Kant, but I don't know whether you are, John. Uh, Timmers was a terrible name dropper, so he always knew when he'd been, uh, as he would have it, browsing in Durkheim or kind of looking at French anthropologists or whatever. But I must say, I haven't come across. Uh, any reference to Kant, uh, and I uh, think if I understood the first part of the question correctly, he would dispute, as would 
a lot of people in social policy, the idea that it was a discipline anyway, it's, it's, it's an academic field rather than a, a discipline of a defined mm -hmm. uh, subject matter. But I'm going to cop out on that one, I'm afraid, and say, in my extensive reading of Richard Titmuss, uh, German philosophers don't feature terribly heavily. Well, a question now from Jonathan Bradshaw. Um, Timbers was very concerned with fertility in the 1940s. Can you comment on why we are not so concerned now when it is so much lower? Do you have any, any particular views on that? Do you want me to come in again? Any, any, any of us, I think. Could, um, um, uh, Lucinda, do you have a views on that? No, no, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, there, there are concerns about fertility and there are concerns about, um, uh, um, I would say, con contemporary rates of fertility, but not a very um, uh, systematic response to it. So, yeah, so I was thinking about something like uh, the parents book on, on parents' revolt, which she wrote with Kathleen um, Titmus, I think. Um, it's... Uh, I mean, trying to trying to raise this, this whole issue of how we think about dem demographic change um, and what we do about it. Um, uh, I, I would say it is. I would say it is a salient issue. It's just there isn't the perhaps in, in uh, perhaps in social policy we're not writing about it as much. But there's certainly quite a lot of work on it um, and consideration of how much you can. Um, I mean that, that comes back, back to some of the ideas of, of what drives, what motivates people, um, and how much you can um, manipulate those motivations. I don't know whether. Sarah wants to say anything on that. Sarah, do you have any views on that? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So I think there is quite a lot of concern with the uh, fertility. Um, maybe not as I. I'm not too familiar with uh, UK-based policies towards it, but in France and Scandinavia and other, um, I think in Belgium, for example, I'm aware of specific policies to incentivize uh, the fertility rate of women. Uh, uh, so I think. Um, it is a big concern. It's a topic that is particularly um, hard to address and to uh, to provide for, I think. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Lucinda, there's a question that's dropped off my screen, unfortunately, but I do remember um, it was concerned um, the extent to which um, uh, the, uh, since Titmus, social policy has been um, uh, so the uh, the asker of the question says has been notably um, the analysis of ethnicity and race has been noticeably absent um, from social policy discourse. Um, why is this? Well, a is this true? <laughs> uh, and B, uh, if it is, why do you think it might be? Well, if I said it was true, then I'd kind of be discounting most of my research, wouldn't I? So uh, I would say it's not... Well, that's part of what I was thinking, yes. <laughs> There's quite a lot of research on... Um, uh, um, so if you're thinking just UK, um, it, there, there's, there's, there has been an increasing amount of research um, that's on, on, on race, ethnicity and social policy, I would say. And partly that's, that increase has been driven by um, uh, the availability of data. So before the 1991 census, it was actually quite hard to look at... Um, look at ethnic inequalities um, in any, any any domain but now it's it's um, there's there's quite a lot done and I just think the attention I mean I've been doing work on for example on, on recently on, on COVID and, and um, ethnic disproportionalities in the in the impacts of um, COVID there's um, I'm I, I'm very much not alone in doing that work um, uh, I like to think that you know I was I was at the forefront of it but but there's been plenty of other research coming that you could say social policy um, there, I mean, if I, I haven't looked, I think that um, there, there may be, um, you know, somebody may have looked systematically at about, about publications. It may be partly because um, uh, there are different ways that people who are working in this area publish. And, you know, quite a lot of my work's been in, um, as well as academic articles, has also been in commission research for government. But that seems like what social policy researchers should also be doing. Um, so I think there's, I think there's quite a lot there. <laughs> Um, uh, there's probably always more. I mean, there's always there is always more we could be doing. But in terms of understanding issues of income distribution, I, I've done a lot on that. Um, understanding gender inequalities and pay gaps, um, uh, things that I think are quite fundamental to social policy and ethnic inequalities. I think there's quite a lot there. That would Thank you. Uh, a question from Jim Elder Woodward, who describes himself as an elderly disabled user of social care. How would Tismuth react to today's feminist economists like Himmelweit, um, oops, uh, um, uh, who advocate that investment in social care 
particularly per COVID-19, is much more cost beneficial to the social infrastructure of the country's wealth than investing in physical infrastructure of the country's wealth. I take it that we, I imagine that most of us would rather strongly agree with that. <laughs> Sarah, do you have a view? <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, the, the systems, the, they talk to each other, right? So by investing in the social care, then uh, it will necessarily foster the development of the other physical infrastructure as well. Um, it's, I don't think that we can actually consider them as two separate things. I do think, I completely agree that injecting the money via the social care um, bin would be a very worthwhile investment. And I think that that would go in line with what Titmus would think as well. I think if I could just yeah. very quickly chip in there, I mean, I think one of the things that's worth emphasizing about Titmus was that he thought the welfare state should be about human relationships in some sort of way. That, that if you were a social worker, it wasn't just simply a matter of being a technocrat and knowing what benefits were available or something like that. You had to kind of have a relationship uh, with your client. Uh, doctors ideally would have uh, relationships with their patients, which went beyond the clinical, as it were. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the kind of great insights he had that was that if you were going to have a welfare state, and let's remember that he always put the expression welfare state in inverted commas, but it should be about human relationships and it should be about promoting uh, social solidarity and, and uh, addressing inequalities and so on. So I don't think he was a kind of capital investment kind of chap in that kind of way. You would have seen human resources as by far the most important aspect of a welfare system. Well, a, a related question, again, coming from Jim Elder Woodward. Um, the, he says that um, disabled people's organizations here in Scotland are arguing for a rights-based approach rather than a needs-based approach. Um, now, that actually has echoes. I seem to remember that on the whole, Timmus was not very sympathetic to the notion of welfare rights and no. welfare claims. Um, um, what do you think about that? What would what Timmons's attitude to be to uh, the, these kind of developments, do you think, John? I think he was hostile to the, no the notion of welfare rights because he saw it as a field day for lawyers. Uh, that rights became prescriptive uh, and inflexible. Uh, and he used the example of how the social work system in New York City had panned out, which wasn't well. Uh, and that's, you know, the kind of the notion of rights was all, all well and good kind of thing. But once you opened the door to, um, he wasn't a great fan of the legal profession. Uh, once you opened the, the door to lawyers uh, saying this right has not been satisfied, then you could end up in all sorts of, sorts of tangles, which once again lost sight of uh, the people who were supposed to be benefiting from uh, any particular welfare policy. So certainly in an abstract sense, he was, he was quite hostile to the, the idea of prescriptive rights. Mm -hmm. He certainly wasn't, he wasn't very sympathetic to the students, I seem to recall in the 1968, um, the 1968 Troubles at LSE. He wasn't... <laughs> Demanding their rights was not his. Uh... Yes, I think I think he's rather robust Jews about that. <laughs> um, Edward Higgs from the University of Essex has asked, uh, "What were Titmus's view of eugenics and Francis Galton's statistical work, given its influence on leading members of the Fabian Society in the interwar period?" Now we haven't talked about that so far, but um, uh, do you have a word or two on that, John? Yes, I mean, I think it's one of the things that's kind of quite often brought up about Tim is that from the 1930s onwards, he was a member of the Eugenics Society, uh, although he played very little part in it after the Second World War. Um, and he certainly had kind of eugenic ideas, particularly early on when he was looking at population health. But having said that, um, he also... Uh, saw eugenics as the, the eugenic society of which he was a member of. Uh, he rather shamelessly, I think, used this to kind of network with people like William Beveridge and uh, Alexander Carl Saunders and all the rest of it later, you know, his, his boss at the LSE. Um, but also the eugenic society provided a kind of platform um, from, for, for, for those who were interested in population and population health. But he was certainly very sceptical about the, what he called the Galton generation, people who looked back to 
to Francis Galton and saw him, saw Galton as having provided the kind of ultimate way of looking at population issues. Uh, he was much keener on a kind of environmental change. Uh, he said you couldn't address eugenic issues uh, until uh, you'd sorted out environmental issues, which kind of kicks the can quite a long way down the road, actually. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, he was. There's no getting away from the fact he was a long-standing member of the Eugenic Society. But to be fair to me, he was extremely critical of what he saw as the, the backwoodsman of the, of the Galton generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Hartley Dean asks us, um, picking up on Timmons' concern to bring processes of institutionalized altruism and universalized reciprocity. I'm sorry, the, the, my screen is, is flashing back and forth here. Um, uh, to bear, uh, to, uh, sorry, let me start again. Picking up on Titmus's concern to bring processes of institutionalized altruism and universalized reciprocity to bear in the context of new forms of advantage and disadvantage, how in the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic might he or indeed we confront not only market fundamentalism, but also the socially divisive trend towards far-right or amoral populism. Well, there's another of those uh, uh, um, those questions. Uh, so let, 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 me, let, me, let me dump on, on Lucinda, so forgive me. <laughs> uh, so this seems to be a very, a very broad question. I mean, it seems to be saying, I don't, um, yeah, what, what, what should we do about the state of the world now, as far as I can understand it? So, um, uh, sorry, sorry, if I mis, uh, misunderstood it. I mean, it's. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that there's an absence of people analysing both the issues of how divided our society is, um, and also trying to think about um, ways in which um, you know, ways in which there might be more uh, sort of interdependence. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I suppose you know a, a big challenge is the role of of, of the state um, when we I see something like in the UK and um, the level of geographical inequalities um, is one which um, is, is is very stark and is really striking in the current current period, um, and the long term consequences of that um, uh, seem to be concerns we should be engaging with, but there does seem to need to be some engagement with those who could actually do something about it as well. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, I'm not quite sure what we're being asked to say here, what we're being asked to do. Sorry, sorry for some Well, I think the idea is whether would Timmons have had anything to say about populism? What would his attitudes be towards populism? Of course, I mean, he, he did, he, a lot of his intellectual development occurred during a period of uh, fascist populism in the 1930s. Um, and presumably, did, did he, John, did he have any specific sort of dealings with um, with the far right um, in Britain at that time? I mean, the, there is the connection with the eugenic society, unfortunately, but uh, was there anything was there anything more political that he was involved in? Yeah, very much so, actually. I mean, in the 1930s, he was a very active member of the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, among those who demonstrated against Mosley's fascists at, at Cable Street. Uh, and interestingly, in the light of what you said yourself a minute ago, Julian, he, he reminded some of his critics during the troubles at the LSE that he had actually confronted fascism uh, face to face, as it were, back in the 1930s. Um, and he, he was drawing up very clever analogy with the behaviour of uh, some students and some members of staff at the LSE during the so-called troubles. Um, so I think he was kind of uh, certainly aware of uh, the dangers of fascism, having kind of you know, grown up with it, as it were. Um, whether we can look to him to address right-wing populism nowadays, I think is, is, I'm sure there's plenty in there, but it's quite a big ask, actually, since as far as I can see, none of the rest of us have come up with any coherent plans to address right-wing populism. It's a bit, <laughs> it's asking a bit much of the late Richard Timmis, but um, uh, I'm sure there's stuff in there. I'd have to think about that more than I'm All right. let me Let me just come back for a moment to the question about race. It was from Gary Craig, um, and he's um, 
provide a supplementary note here that the, the question he asked was more about the teaching and learning, that there is quite a lot of research, he acknowledges, not least by Lucinda, of course, but very little in teaching and learning. And he was referring to a social policy association report that was based on a survey of all 61 uh, HEIs and claiming to teach social policy and found very little, if any, teaching on race and ethnicity. Do you think that's changing, Lucinda? I mean, do, do we know um, whether... So, yeah, I mean, I can, I can speak for, um, I can speak for the LSE. It's a bit harder to speak for, for the um, uh, mm. other, other institutions, but I mean, I, certainly there has been, a, there has been a, 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 an increased volume of discussion since, since the summer, since Black Lives Matter, um, in particular about the extent to which um, uh, issues of race and ethnicity are incorporated in the syllabus. Um, I think um, it, um, it is covered in various parts of the LSE syllabus, both at undergraduate and, and master's level. Um, uh, whether, whether that's, um, whether, um, but whether it, it, there should be a sort of more, more um, an approach to incorporating it across, the, across um, teaching as a whole, or whether it more in dedicated courses, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a discussion to be, to be had. Um, and also there's a lot of attention now to this um, question of the decolonization of the curriculum. Um, again, a lot of discussion of what exactly that means. Is it about, is it about what you put on the reading list? Is it about who writes it or where they're writing about or what perspective they come from or in some sense all three. But certainly I think there's, um, um, at LSE and I think a lot of other institutions, there's, there's at least an attempt to think through what, what a decolonized curriculum might be, even though there's never going to be an end point to that. You know, you're not going to have the final curriculum where you say, that, okay, this is it, this is, this is decolonized now. So, so, it's, so it's a very live issue. Um, uh, it's a live issue now, and I would expect that um, there will probably be changes to curricula um, across the discipline over the coming year, um, partly as a result of this impetus. But certainly um, there, is the, the, there, is some, there is some coverage of these issues already in the, in, in the LSE syllabus, but I think we're also thinking about how we, how we develop and how we treat those issues. Okay, thank you. Um, Lucy Thompson, um, are you going to answer this question as a contribution to make that question? No, apparently not. Sorry, I seem to have a note to that effect. But no. um, Juan Costa Font asks, um, well, he makes a point, comment, really. I think that Titmus made great points on blood donation, but he ignored a number of other social incentives, i.e. social observability, and even monetary ones that don't give a rise to crowding out e.g. days off work, etc. I do think that um, I do, it, that echoes an awful lot of my own views about uh, Titmus was that he was, uh, he was only looking at one form of motivation and he really, <coughs> uh, he really was um, almost dismissive of other kinds of motivation, uh, including crowding in kinds of motivation and indeed more self-interested versions. Um, um, Anno Rum, who is a student at the LSE, asks, um, did Titmus consider how policies encouraging donation that do not rely on financial incentives, for example, a shift from an opt-in to an opt-out organ donation system, affect intrinsic motivation? I don't think he did, John, that he really he didn't really think about intrinsic, I don't think Sarah, I don't think he really... No, I think, and that my thought on that goes in line with the previous question as well. I think that's what defines a seminal work. Right, uh, that you open the door and then you leave it for other people to walk through it as well, right? And uh, in terms of opt out and opt in, it would be something that wouldn't even be on the radar at that point, right? And mm -hmm. those would be questions that would come up later on and they can be inspired by his line of reasoning, but uh, it wouldn't be something that he would be able to even assess at that point. Yes, my instinct is that he might not have been very sympathetic to it because in some senses he wanted the expression of altruism to be explicit, not not a sort of the, an accidental consequence of a, a change in the choice architecture, as the uh, as the nudge um, advocates would say. John, did you have a view? No, I mean I think that's I think that's right. I mean he saw it as uh, as kind of um, individually motivated as well, and, and and kind of a desire as he saw this kind of biological desire to uh, to help other people. Um, so if it's fulfilling for the self, but also fulfilling for society. I mean, I think he, it was quite narrow that kind of perspective that he had. Mm -hmm. um, Sally Sheard, uh, University of Liverpool and a biographer of Brian Abel Smith, I believe, um, 
how would uh, how would Titmus view how academics are now used as experts by politicians and policymakers? And it begs a number of questions, of course. How are academics now used? <laughs> and uh, there's a wonderful quote I think from uh, an economist called Morris Peston, who was um, who acted as a special advisor to a minister on one occasion, and it was in the time when people were arguing for um, that very important to have job descriptions. And so he was asked um, to provide a job description for being special advisor to a minister. And he said, uh, oh, my, that's quite simple. My job is to provide the intellectual ammunition to reinforce the prejudices of the minister. <laughs> and uh, I must say, having worked as a special advisor myself, there's something to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what uh, do do any of the uh, panel have views on that particular issue? Well, I mean, I don't think you'd do all this work if you thought it was just going to be ignored. Um, and certainly, there was engagement. I mean, an in, in income dis um, distribution of social change is based on uh, he sent a very detailed questionnaire to. I mean, this was to civil servants, but even so, he was engaging with. Um, uh, civil servants and policy makers to try and get the information they knew what he was doing and he was thinking this was a clearly thinking this was a conversation um in in the, in the sense that you know that there was no they were not they were not bound to fill in this questionnaire or try and disentangle some of these problems of what exactly the tax unit was so i mean i, I think it, but 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 it begs the question of what the what the um what the questioner thinks thinks how academics are used now so um uh I think, so if they're just being used as ammunition, I don't think he would be um, uh, supportive of that. I think he would be supportive of um, the idea that there was some sort of conversation. So who, who knows whether that's the case or not. I mean. I suddenly found myself that, sorry, uh, can, can we unmute Sally Sherd if she's, uh, if she's there and we could get her response to that view, is that possible? Well, while it's, that's being thought about, um, my own view is that um, it, it was interesting working as a special advisor. There was a very different role. Your role as if you're evaluating a policy proposal as an academic, you put the advantages uh, on the one side and then the disadvantages. You try to come to a balanced judgment about whether it's a, uh, it's a pro. <laughs> I tried when I was working as a, um, in government, I tried to write papers of that kind. Um, which um, went down like lead balloons. I was only surprised to write the advantages of particular problems. Um, maybe have a slightly disarming view, uh, to, uh, to attempt to disarm any critics. One would try acknowledge how a little PS to say, oh, oh, well, of course there is this issue or not. But you, the argument that the writing of a paper was to make a case for a particular case rather than the others. Um, um, yeah, but I think we've, all, we've probably all had that experience where that you, something's commissioned and you don't come up with the right answer. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I've had that experience where, and then there's this ongoing, you know, you, you sure you can't come up with the right answer? Can you do a bit more analysis? And so you've done it all and it's still not coming Maybe up with the right answer. Absolutely. And, and then something being published in you know, a sort of Christmas Eve um, so that nobody actually ever reads it. Um, but I don't think, that's, I don't think uh, that's always the case. I think it depends who you're, a little bit who you're working with. And the department. Mm -hmm. John? I, 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 Sally wouldn't be astonished that I'm going to answer her question next in a roundabout way, but uh, it was quite revealing that when Titmus died, the front page obituary on the, the New York Times said the author of the gift relationship is dead. Mm -hmm. And if Titmus did have an impact on actual policies, it, were, it, it was probably in the United States where federal law about um, uh, blood acquisition was changed, um, it becomes less clear cut in Britain, except, I mean, what I tried to argue in a bit was that um, he kind of set the terms of the debate and uh, him and Abel Smith and, and Townsend and Donison and all the rest of them. And um, I, I thought in his kind of eulogy at Timothy's memorial service, Richard Crossman was quite interesting about that, about how, you know, the, these were academics who kind of learned the rough old trade of politics, but nonetheless, there was a kind of relationship going on there from which both Crossman and, and, and Titmus and his colleagues had, had learned. I mean, I think uh, uh, Sully's done Brian Abel Smith, as it were, who seems to be a more clear-cut 
case of somebody who was actually part of the heart of government. But uh, but nonetheless, I think Tim has helped set the agenda for, for a long time. Indeed. Is, is, Sally, um, is Sally there? No, it appears we can't, uh, we can't ar arrange that at the moment. So uh, there's a question here from, um, uh, from uh, Paul Dolan um, for, for everybody. Um, do you think that Timbus's work on social policy in wartime, such as responses to the child evacuation policy and on public health, could be revisited? Perhaps even now an official history of the pandemic nowadays in the four countries. Any volunteers to write the... Uh, uh... Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually quite an interesting question. Now, again, I don't want to monopolise the conversation, but the, the question is quite right. Problems of social policy, Titmus's contribution to uh, the uh, series and uh, the official series on, on, on the war on the home front was immensely influential and um, still shapes in some respects the way we view the home front during the Second World War. Uh, whether it offers any lessons for present day historical writing would be, even contemporary history would be more open to question, but I think it, it's, it's problems of social policy deserves more attention than it sometimes get. It's not just a collection of facts and data. It has actually some quite significant things to say, it seems to me, about the direction in which society should head after a traumatic event like the Second World War. So possibly uh, if somebody wants to take on board doing something for the pandemic, I think that would be immensely useful. Yeah. The question is whether it's slightly early. Oh, Lucinda. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Lucinda, yes. I was just going to say, I mean, it seems like the, they might be, it might be slightly premature at the moment to um, think about the future direct to, to write a history, um, but... Um, um, I think it is quite interesting to think about the way that Titmus would have responded though. I mean, I mean, John Ashworth made very much the point that he, the focus on inequality would have been a big issue for him. Yeah. Uh, and the difference in the, in the responses and equality, as indeed it should be. Um, that seems to be, that, that's a big issue. Whether the gift relationship, whether the, the stuff from the, well, I mean, as Sarah was saying that there's elements in, two, in terms of the altruism, uh, displayed by the uh, NHS workers and others that, that echo some of the points being made in the gift relationship. <coughs> um, we have, sorry, Sarah. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to put a plug in here for the militarization of the dialogue around the pandemic. I think it would be a good way of um, uh, wrapping up that debate in a way of channeling it towards a more efficient like social policy and welfare uh, dialogue rather than this fighting the pandemic uh, per se, but like this British war efforts that is then translated into the, the aftermath of the pandemic. So you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I think there is, it is happening. Uh, there is a, a, like in the, in the international relations, I mean, it is happening. So we might as well just use it for the good and channel it towards um, that's like the decrease of the inequalities, for example. Yeah. So now I've been thinking that the, the, the situation does rather call for something equivalent to the beverage report um, for a sort of statement of post COVID recovery plan yep. in some senses that tries to take on board all these issues and all these fault lines in British society that have been developed and exacerbated indeed by the, uh, by the, uh, the, by the Brexit phenomenon, indeed by Brit sorry, by the COVID <laughs> but, also, but also by Brexit uh, preceding it. Um, in that sense, I think the inequality agenda is a real, you know, where, where the, his ways of thinking about inequality would be the, possibly the model to follow um, um, as rather than writing a history of the pandemic as a history of what was happening on the, um, in the war on the home front, but to think about the inequality implications and who is uh, who is included and excluded um, at a, at, during the pandemic and who's suffering most. Um, and I think some of these, um, again, some of the, the geographical inequalities about what is, who is affected in the country would also have some, some resonance for past, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, past crises as well. We have an interesting question here from um, Brazil, um, uh, from Adriana Aranha, who's a public manager and teacher in Brazil. <coughs> she, she says, for Titmus, 
social needs are socially constructed and recognized needs. How could Titmus's teachers, sorry, how could Titmus's teachings help us to analyze the experience of a country like Brazil, which has been consolidating a state of well being since the 1988 constitution, and more recently of progressive governments, uh, Lula and Dilma, and which now, with the destruction of these policies by the current government, Bolsonaro, uh, and with the worsening of the social issues by COVID-19 with latent needs. Um, but again, it seems to me this is the question of, of well, how do Titmus, well, I suppose more generally, how do we all respond to populism? How does social, what does social policy uh, uh, do in a world of populism? It has right. a lot to do with the concern with, with what are what is our main concern, right? Um, and with the general preferences, in a way, um, if it's if the focus is to make sure that the poorest are brought to a minimum uh, quality of life, um, that doesn't seem to be the focus of populism. So it would it would need to be by putting the spotlight on a different on that potential preference you know to take care of the of the poorest and the sickest mm. Mm. And maybe there is something to learn from titmus about how um uh, agendas can be kind of um presented or how uh, the truth can be presented in in um, particular ways which seem self-evident you know that the fact that the the, the, the hard-working middle classes are, are paying for the um poor um who are not hard-working uh, so that how that becomes, um, I mean, how that becomes an accepted uh, way of thinking about the world. Um, I mean, Titmus was waiting to say, let's look carefully at why that isn't true. Um, and let's look at the way that um, uh, power is being consolidated. I mean, this is, this is a sort of analysis that, but how you can then communicate that because um, uh, just people to see that actually maybe their interests are not being favored by populism or that it is uh, a sort of consolidation of of power and interest. Um, so I, I, I guess that would be his approach, but I think the, 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 the challenge is how you, how you effectively communicate that. Yes. Um, populist social policy is, I mean, indeed, fascist social policy, as I recall, is actually quite oriented towards the poor quite often, isn't it? It is, it is designed to try to appeal to the masses deliberately, and often by things like food subsidies or uh, <coughs> or bread subsidies or whatever, public transport subsidies. Uh, it's often quite a, a, quite a, a drive in that respect. John, did I mean, you want Families to uh, and fascist and uh, social policy as manifested say, in Nazi Germany or in Mussolini's Italy, the family was a kind of focal point and that was where social policy was to be directed at, if you see what I mean, that, 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 that was the fundamental institution of uh, society and that, that's why you see so much kind of family policy still there's still residues of that in some uh, Mediterranean societies today the, 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 the kind of impact of fascist social policy. Yes, yes interesting um, uh, Stephen Ball Steve Ballard has come on and said wasn't it also family and fatherland of course yes. so yes uh, the, 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 uh, the, the nation state being modelled as a family with the dictator of course as the parent as the lead parent um, well, we're coming near the end now um, of our session. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions. <coughs> so um, uh, I would like to begin my conclusion, but just before I do, is there any last um, words that, um, uh, Sarah, you would like to make? Any last points you'd like to make or Lucinda? Nothing more particularly. To... John, any, any final comments? Um, on the well, it up a can of worms, but I mean, I thought what Lucinda said about the utilization of data by Titmus was very interesting because from the 1930s onwards, he was very, very skeptical about the quality and quantity of official data. And I don't know if that's still an issue in social policy nowadays, but if you look at what Abel Smith and Titmus did in the Gillibo report, they, they were consistently complaining about the paucity of information they had at their, at their fingertips as well. Right, well, well, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you all for your insights um, into this, uh, into <coughs> this remarkable man, I must say. Um, 
and his remarkable work. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure to have the opportunity for both me and I think for all of us um, to listen to our panel. And thank you very much for taking part. Um, we're most grateful you, that you could find time in your schedule to actually uh, to be with us today. Um, now, as you can see from, I think, a slide that's on the, uh, on the screen, that attendees at today's event can receive a special 30% discount to purchase John Stewart's biography, magisterial biography, if I may say so, magisterial biography of Richard Titmuss from Bristol University Press. Please follow the link provided on the screen and to use the code PORTLSE, that's capitals P-O-R-T-L-S-E, when completing your purchase. So from all of us at LSE, we wish you well, and we hope to see you again soon. If you'd like to learn more about the organizing departments uh, and their research, please visit the LSE, so, so, sorry, excuse me, please visit the LSE website or follow us on Twitter at LSE Health Policy and at LSE Social Policy. Thank you and goodbye.